Good morning and welcome to our session. Can everybody hear me okay? All right. Uh, my name is John Abrish, and I'm coordinator of collections at the USF Library in Tampa. And with me are my colleagues, Laura Pasquale, interim director of collections and discovery, also at the USF Library, and Anna Seifert, who is the head of collection management services at the Arthur Lakes Library at the Colorado School of Mines. For my part of the program, I will introduce a conceptual framework for communicating diverse aspects of the collection management life cycle to library stakeholders. Laura will provide additional insights and web page metrics from our study. And Anna will provide a case study of communicating, communicating budget information to stakeholders at the Arthur Lakes Library. In our survey of collection management and communication practices, we sampled over 25 academic libraries and found a wide range of activities that parallel findings in the research literature on communications and collection management. Four communicative strategies that were significant in the research literature, and I will discuss briefly, are enhancing internal communications in libraries, building relationships between the library and its stakeholders, and building narratives around collections. And finally, establishing a communication assessment plan. The survey of professional literature also found that published best practices do not adequately explain how to communicate with stakeholders, though it, they say it is a good idea to do so. Contemporary collection management processes and practices, when looking at the whole life cycle of information resources, often involves a whole village of individuals who perform a myriad of functions from back-end IT, support to tech services, processing functions to public services reference support. Solutions to collection inquiries can involve bits of knowledge from individuals performing specific functions as information flows across a library organization. With these complex library organizations, associated with collection management life cycle. An important element that appears in much of the research literature is establishing good internal communications. Staff members need to have clear lines of communication between units. Everybody needs to be on the same page message-wise. Research articles emphasize the need to avoid information siloing between departments. Another concept in building effective communication frameworks is to build relationships with library stakeholders. In an era of data-driven collection building, there is a need for effective communication channels between stakeholders. Often, library facilitates solutions to collection issues are the result of interactions between several groups, both internal and external to the library. Three relationship building actions among stakeholders that I'll provide examples on are from experiences that we've had at the University of South Florida Library, including leveraging information technologies and partnerships, leveraging staff expertise, and library outreach to diverse groups. An approach in enhancing relationships among stakeholders associated with collection management at the USF Library that we've been looking into is based on the notion of communities of practice. Developing a community of practice focused on collections involved inviting individuals to participate in a team-oriented collection building environment. The goal of the endeavor was to create shared values in a collection focus area. When the USF Library was challenged to build research-intensive collections or engage in university initiatives advocating student success and faculty research endeavors, the community of practice approach allowed librarians at USF to explore new ways of developing partnerships with librarian staff, resulting communication interactions, contributions from individuals with unique perspectives. All these interactions helped to develop narratives and stories around collections that affected library budget planning, collection planning, looking at staff needs and, and meeting strategic university strategic goals. Examples of narratives built around collections at the University of South Florida include collection-focused narratives. One of our big initiatives was developing of geoscience collections where we managed to engage several stakeholders in the collection management process. 
Sex Worker Fiddleability was another initiative that integrated diverse library e-collections and resources for a well-defined return on investment supporting student success. And more recently, we began a Scarlet Communication Roadshow, which was a collaborative library effort at supporting faculty research productivity. For the geosciences, uh, when challenged with creating a research-intensive collection, the library assembled a group of faculty external to the library with unique skills and geospatial message, methods, that is, and which we launched what we call the Digital Heritage and Humanities Collections, or DHHC, which is in the USF libraries. The team, using reality capture, 3D, spatial documentation strategies, uh, use the technology to record heritage sites, landscapes, and objects. Digital collections were created that promoted heritage preservation research, education, tourism interpretation, strategies, and hence unique narratives. Some of the collections included 3D images of the Castillo de San Marcos National Monument, as well as digital images of the remains of historical space launch complexes at Cape Canaveral. This effort at using library facilitated technologies to help foster sustainable relationships between academic departments, private sector researchers, and public agencies. Another aspect of the geoscience collection was leveraging staff expertise. A lot of our catalogers had a interest in mapping or cataloging maps. And we uh, developed relationships with the Touchton Map Library in Florida Center for Cartographic Education, which is the Tampa Bay History Center in Tampa, and home to thousands of maps, charts, and other documents dating back from the early European exploration of North America. Our catalogers worked on site creating metadata to aid and discover unique research collections. And generally, their activity helped develop opportunities and brought new insights with our burgeoning geosciences collection. The next challenge for the catalogers are to make our new geosciences collections more discoverable, perhaps experimenting with open link data. A more newer endeavor in our building narratives around collections is what we call a scholarly communication roadshow, which is an interactive workshop focused on enhancing faculty scholarly productivity. Several library faculty and staff members collaborate to promote data management services, open access publishing alternatives, and author rights. The effort developed an additional network of engaged faculty members with the interest in digital collections and thus more stories around the use of the collections. This roadshow introduced the concept of open access materials to many of our faculty. And some of our recent uh, success in this area revolves around <clears throat> the, uh, the publication or the faculty authoring of open access textbooks in English and I think physics as well. Oh, chemistry, excuse me. And again, as the process continues, we expect more stories from these collaborations to come out which will help point the direction of this collection. Probably our most successful uh, experience with narratives around collections with, with our textbook affordability efforts at USF. Uh, this textbook affordability initiative grew out of the collaboration between librarians, campus bookstore reps, and representatives from vendor publishers. Librarians were able to create solutions that ensured all students have access to course materials. And through these efforts, we were able to save students a significant amount of money, calculated to be over 20 million since 2010. And the feedback we've been getting from students from this endeavor has helped create a whole series of messaging, of, of social media, and, you know, and other um, messaging and communication framed around the idea of TAP. An integral part of communicate, uh, communicative framework with uh, library stakeholders is through library advisory groups. Once you have a framework in place, 
advisory groups are often uniquely placed to provide feedback and interaction <laughs> for a lot of activities the library has engaged in. Once a communicator framework is established, st stakeholders can uh, keep engaged through the use of advisory groups or councils. In fact, at USF, our faculty library advisory group has been really integral in helping us plan a lot of our <coughs> graduate research collections in the humanities. A final aspect of building a, a communication framework in library settings is an assessment plan. Communication assessment plans are usually part of a strategic or marketing plan, or if no strategic plan exists, it could be tied to a library's mission and outcomes. And often communication assessment involves data derived from website messaging. And now my colleague Laura will introduce some findings from our survey with a focus on library web page communications. So John gave you all the, the good um, background on everything, and I'm more, yeah, talk to the microphone. Um, I'm approaching this more as I had a problem in that I needed to actually <laughs> tell the faculty and patrons, students, what was going on. Um, getting, buying the resource, making it available, implementing it, that's only half the battle. The second half is communicating that you have it and what's going on with it. So. Um, uh, that's where I started off, and what I have available to do that is the library website. That's where everybody goes for the resources, and so this seems like it's the logical place where everybody should go to find information. Um, so it's our channel that already exists. Um, we already provide, uh, we're supposed to be experts at making everything discoverable, so I want to make this information discoverable too, more than just the resources, but this information that is in demand. All right, so what did I need to communicate? Well, the first, the first thing was uh, a new resource comes up. You implement it, you make it work, now you've got to tell people about it. That wasn't so bad. Um, we, uh, um, I do a test course, make it work, we talk to the reference librarians, we do a lib guide, then it gets put out there. Okay, that's good, we've communicated it. But now it gets a little harder. So we have a lot of evidence-based ebook programs at uh, USF and Ebooks are bad enough by themselves for faculty and users to understand with all the different platforms and models that can be. But now you say, oh, it's going to disappear. It's not perpetual. Um, that, that was really a hard part, um, is understanding that it's, it's, it's like a subscription, but it's a little different because not all the books disappear. Um, the models can be different. Um, how do you make sure that the book that the faculty was using yesterday isn't gone today? So you want to let, let them know what's going on about these programs. So that was, that was, that was my second thing I wanted to communicate. Um, then, you know what, I'm not showing you my slides, am I? I just realized that. I actually have this on uh, the PowerPoint here somewhere. Library website. Things I need to communicate. OK, um, streaming media. So we had, like everybody else, a PDA program. Everybody loved it. Um, then we couldn't keep that going, so we have a mediated version now. And that has, uh, we have a lovely LibGuide. We have a complete title list of everything we have, but I don't think anybody really finds it. Um, it is on the library website, but it's in a LibGuide, and I don't, uh, that's one of the things. How do I communicate that here it is, there it is, find it, uh, we have that information. So that's, uh, that was my next problem. And, um, and then, of course, resource cancellations and ads, ads and cancellations, both um, I want to be able to have a place that people can find um, that information as well. Let's see, so let's, let's not go miss this slide. Um, and I realize this, this, this needing to communicate this type of information is not really new. I mean, we've always needed to communicate this kind of information, but it seems like now it's coming from more almost more the back end, the technical services, the analytics side, as opposed to the reference side. Um, that's, that's our department, that's, that's where we're looking at it. So, we need to be, make our department more visible. Um, we're used to being the little invisible back end, probably kind of like it that way, but uh, now it's about having your web page, having your bios, um, say, having our contact information up there. Um, when these questions come up, uh, we're there to answer them. Um, 
And then once we're visible, we have to be transparent. Um, we want to make people aware of what we do. Um, so I think that uh, those are two of the main goals of having our library department webpage. Right now, we're in the process of doing that. We have bits and pieces that are there. It's not all coherent, and uh, I don't have everything that I want there. And that's where I decided to, OK, let me look and see what everybody else is doing. So I thought, OK, I'll, I'll do a survey. I'll get some uh, data points, look at some libraries, figure out what's going on, make it a formal thing. Um, and that's what I did. I uh, started off, I, I got a whole bunch of, uh, let's see, I probably have another slide. Well, I guess I could talk about, uh, I pretty much did. Um, well, let's go around. Um, so in the survey, I, I, I got a huge list of libraries, 120 of them. And then I had about 50 data points that I thought would be interesting to look at when I looked at these. That was severely overambitious. Um, <laughs> I ended up with 20, 25 uh, libraries is what I came out to be, because it took a really long time to really poke around. Um, so, I'm, so I'm looking at this as my pilot survey, uh, figuring out what data points I could collect and um, limiting it to that amount. And uh, I ended up with uh, a few key data points, uh, which we'll go over pretty soon. Um, I, I was looking for um, some standard information um, formal collection development policies. This, this is all the stuff I wanted to communicate, so this is what I was looking for on other uh, websites. Because um, I'm looking to build a communication infrastructure, a place where everybody can find uh, this information. So, for my survey design, uh, I took the classic element uh, an item to look for, which was a collection development policy. And you would think that would be easy, but it's not. It's not really easy to find on a lot of websites. Um, and then the, uh, another, the other item I wanted to look for was um, information on sustainable pricing models, which is, um, I love that word, sustainable. It's so perfectly appropriate. Um, sustainable, sustainability, renewable energy, um, and that's what we want to be able to do, renew our resources. It seems just perfect, but it's also code for probably budget cuts and need, needing to be able to do things cheaper. So um, I'll talk about the keywords that I looked for that helped. Um, but my survey wasn't, th that I did of the websites was not about identifying and, and the processes. It was about finding the information, where the information is located, because I want to talk about communicating this information, not, not just how, we, how somebody did the process. So this, I, I, took, I took that list of 120 and said, OK, I, I have to narrow it down. Uh, even though I had a lot of great inter universities on the list, very interesting. Um, I got the iPads data. I mixed it in. I tried to get um, a geographic uh, range. Um, so I got all over the country, some, some from every region. Um, I, I, got, I looked at the Spark Big Deal list to see who was already doing this. So I, so I had some th people that should actually have this information. They've done this work, so it should be there somewhere on their website, perhaps. Um, and then uh, deciding what to collect. Um, it was an iterative process. I, I started looking at websites and I said, oh, I could get this. And then I said, nope. And then I overdid it. And then I, I ended up with the, uh, the few key points going back and forth, <clears throat> which um, was mainly the URLs for the collection development policy and any cancellation um, uh, processes that where they had budget cuts, uh, discussions on sustainability. Um, I was looking for those, those URLs. I was looking for where those items were located on the library webpage, where, where you had to click to get them, how visible were they, um, and the detail level of the data. Did they have just an overview? Did they have a lot of detail? What, what was the depth of the data? And the scope of the years. Um, some people have been doing this for a long time. Some people have just been doing it recently. Some people have a few various years. So that's, uh, that's, that's what I was looking for when I was looking at the websites. So after... After going um, back and forth, um, the, my search approach became look, at the collect, look for a collections page. A lot of libraries have a page for collections, which really means the collection department, not, not the digital collections, not the special <coughs> collections, but the collections department. Um, a, lot of it, a lot of times this information is in the LibGuides, and a lot of times I would branch off the About page. Um, I clicked on all the menus, on all the pages, on all the, the, main, the main page. I clicked on everything just to see where everything would come up. Um, sometimes, just like other people's websites, it's easier to start in Google and say, University X, Collection Development Policy, and see where it takes me. Um, 
uh, some library websites have a search function where you can search the whole website. And the same when you go to LibGuides, you can search for keywords in the LibGuides. And the keywords I was using were sustainable, cancellation, budget, maybe budget cut, cost per use, serials. Some people call it serials review project. I found a bunch of those journals. Um, and then for collection development policy, collection, collection development, collection management, and policies. And this is probably not a perfect process. Um, I haven't figured out a perfect process. It was just a lot of, a lot of searching. Um, I feel like maybe I missed it. I was pretty thorough, but there's a lot of variability among websites. It's not like everybody has their website laid out the same. All the universities are different. There's a lot of commonalities, but they're not all the same. Um, tried to focus on the data elements I was looking for. And like I say, it was very iterative. Um, after several website reviews, um, I reduced the number of data points um, tried, tried to figure out what was basic to all that I could uh, compare amongst the websites. Um, but if there was extra details, I might have written those down too. So this was the distribution I ended up with. Um, I had 13, 13 of the libraries I looked at were on the Spark Big Deal Cancellation Tracking Report. I thought that was, that was about half. That gave me a, a good idea that I should have been able to get information on that. Um, using the region from the iPads, this was a uh, distribution. It seems a little heavy on the southeast. I know I'm from Florida, we're in the southeast, but I didn't really plan it that way. It just kind of ended up that way. Um, the, it was a range of sizes. Um, the all student non-duplicated headcount from the iPads data was ranging from 4,300 to 68,400. But the majority were fairly high level research activity universities. So um, the majority were the highest. And as far as what I found, I found on about 76% of the ones that I looked for, I did find the collection development policy. That may be higher or lower than you think. You think maybe we could have found it, I could have found it on all of them, but not everybody. I didn't. <laughs> um, I only found about a little more than half, something on budget cuts or sustainability. And that might not be something that was traditionally posted, but this is something I think that's coming. Um, and it's one of the things I wanted to look about um, how to post. Um, and, and about half of them were on the Spark list. And uh, I did find on about 28% a really, really wonderful, some really wonderful detailed explanations of the processes they used. I wasn't, uh, it was hard not to review it all because they were, some people really explained really wonderfully. There's some, and I, I, I have one of my slides to say which I thought, I thought were the best ones. And in uh, and, uh, and the years that the, they might have done this kind of evaluation. So uh, also for results, the most common uh, what, um, places I found that led to the data I wanted to were the About page. A lot of times I could find policies or the Collection Development Department off of the About page, or I found a Collections page that was the Collections Department, or in the LibGuides. Um, sometimes I knew they had done it, and um, I, I came in from Google, but it might have been in a newsletter, in a blog. Um, journal articles in the institutional repository, it wasn't always a part of the library's website. Because maybe they're thinking, well, the library's web website is for communications about the resources and not this kind of thing. Um, a few had cost per use details that I could see, and some actually had them password protected, so they wouldn't have been available, because that's uh, an issue as well. Um, so I kept having to remind myself, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not looking about the, um, how to do this, I'm looking about how to communicate this. Um, these are, these are like, to me, hot topics, but I wanted to know how everybody else was communicating. Um, uh, I didn't find, like I say, much consistency um, across the universities. A lot of people did it a lot of different ways, um, except for that I think probably for the budget cuts, it was more likely it was in the LibGuides. I think that gave everybody the flexibility to put the information they wanted there. Um, Sometimes it was really, really uh, hard to find elements. Um, sometimes I found them from Google and I could not, there was no way that I could actually find out how to get there from the library's homepage, uh, even if I clicked on everything. Um, and uh, so maybe, maybe I just couldn't find it. So these were some of my favorites. Um, for details about the cancellation processes, it, they were easy to find. They had a high level of detail, really explained it. The Colorado School of Mines, which Anna will be giving us the details on. Um, really amazingly organized. New Mexico State University, they went all the way back to 1997 um, and it had really a nice consistency for, throughout that. Kansas State had amazing details and uh, 
as well as Oklahoma. So um, for sustainable pricing details, they had a lot of details. The University of Virginia, I, I had trouble finding it because they called it collection disclosures, and it was in it was a little link that was in the narrative, but it really great information. And William Mary has um, something called sustainable collections pricing, but again, not maybe where you'd expect it, but uh, uh, I, I did search and find it. Um, and University of Vermont has an amazing collection development policy, very, very detailed. It was very, had a lot of issues addressed and it was really wonderful. So that, that's my just personal opinion. No, no rubric or anything, just to, um, so I didn't find any perfect method, um, but um, I think as Reagan Nathan said, I saw this somewhere recently, I thought, that's it, we're always changing, we're always growing, so we always have to be adapting, um, and that's what I'm trying to do here. So now Anna is going to come up and she's going to give us uh, her explanation of how she did it. Get out of here. All right, so I'm Anna from Colorado School of Mines. I'm head of collection management services, and I've been there for a little over three years. And um, I'm going to talk about how we've tried to reimagine how we communicate collection and collection decisions with campus. So Colorado School of Mines is a little engineering school nestled up in the foothills um, outside of Denver, Colorado. There um, are 5,800 uh, undergrad students. And in the library, there are 13 librarians, there are nine staff, and we have probably over 100 student workers. They're fabulous. Um, we have two outreach and engagement librarians and um, no formal liaison program. So that helped frame, like, how are we gonna communicate this if we don't have that traditional form of communication? Um, so when I started, um, there was not a lot of, or any, really, feedback from faculty about the collection. Um, communication was sort of broken. And when I asked, how has this been communicated before, um, I got, well, if, if somebody wants something, like a new journal subscription, um, we ask them what they want to cancel. And if they can't think of anything, then we tell them, well, we'll put it on a wish list and we'll hope. Um, that didn't really seem fair to me. It was well-intentioned to try to keep the collection balanced, but um, maybe the biology department was a newer program and they weren't well represented within the library's collections anyways. So saying you need to cancel something when they might only have you know, a few resources um, wasn't really working. So as you can imagine, uh, faculty just stopped asking for things. Um, new programs came up, and on the little form it would say, you know, what resources do you need from the library? Nothing. The library has everything we need. We're okay. Like, check, uh, approve our program, here we go. And then so inflation, you know, journals skyrocketing, our collection wasn't was not keeping up um, and administration didn't understand what was happening. Um, and then the day of reckoning came um, about, when we were looking at our budget about six months after I started and there were some new people in the budget office and they said, okay, instead of just giving us what you, your budget for next fiscal year based on like EBSCO, what's, you know, journal information, um, we want an accounting of every single title, why you canceled things, why you have certain titles, cost per use, like everything at a granular level. I was horrified, obviously. And I respectfully declined. <laughs> um, so that didn't go over very well. So we did not get what we requested for the budget, but um, my boss backed me up. Um, we had a, a modest increase. It wasn't enough to keep up with inflation. Um, so we did, we were gonna need to make some cuts. Um, so previously, 
decisions on the collection were a lot about communication and understanding where the programs were coming from, but cost per use, the hard data was not performed. So it was time for me to dig in, you know, give me all the data. Um, so there was, I nixed uh, no more auto renewals, like no, nothing gets renewed without being evaluated both by the numbers, talking to faculty, um, and all, just all the data. So even though we did have to make some cuts that first year, it was okay, really, because once you start looking at the data, there was a lot of low-hanging fruit, um, a lot of things that research had changed and evolved, programs had changed, and things weren't being used anyways. Um, so, but it really gave me the opportunity to make sure that as the library that we were doing all we could to protect the budget we had and grow, leave space to grow the collection where it needed to go. So the usual things, cost per use, really leveraging our consortia, really pushing back to vendors on cost per use if we didn't have a multi-year agreement, but it was an essential item, well then we need a multi-year agreement so that we can move that forward. Um, and then I needed to think about how to put all this data together and um, actually have it make sense to both faculty and administration. Um, because ad admin didn't know what they were asking for when they're like, give me cost per use and information on the titles. I could drown them, we all could drown them in data, but they wouldn't know what they were looking at, right? I mean, it, it wouldn't be helpful to them anyways. Um, so. I thought we needed a, um, an overall framework of the publishing industry, how it interacts with academic libraries, um, and then remind them of where we were. So EBSCO's annual report is great. We had mixed success um, in previous years with asking for our budget amount based on this. Um, but it wasn't really resonating. So I don't know if you all have used this before and had mix, mixed success. Hopefully we can um, chat some afterwards. Um, and also looking at ARL data um, is also helpful. This was, this spreadsheet uh, graph was more helpful with faculty when we ended up sharing it because I think some were just oblivious. I don't know how they could be, but they were oblivious to what was um, happening overall. Um, and then we needed to get into what was going on at our library. Um, so if we had kept up with inflation over 10 years, that was around 6.5%. Um, our budget would have been over like 25% more than, um, than it currently was. And because we're a STEM institution, we rely heavily on uh, journal subscriptions. And then it just kept eating in to that book budget, you know, the journals just seem to keep ballooning. Um, and then this um, I found to be really helpful. So I took uh, iPads data um, on our peer institutions as well as our aspirational peer institutions, you know, MIT, and said, how do we stack up? Um, and this got uh, faculty going, hey, like, why, you know, we, we have these great missions for the campus, but we're not, we're not keeping up. Like, we need to do better for the library. So um, it was good to see where we ranked. I mean, we weren't, we weren't the worst. Um, there are some others. Um, but we have a long way to go if we want to keep up with the big boys, right? Um, so then the real work began. Um, how do we reset the conversation, especially with faculty? Um, yes, I, I calculated our exact inflation based on renewals um, and faculty feedback on what new money we needed. I gave that to administration and we had pretty good success with that, giving them like the hard data. Like this isn't just some national average, but this is our deals, what we have, this is what we actually need. But the real challenge was getting faculty 
to consider us not the bad guy anymore, always saying no, but a partner with them. So I um, got out from behind my desk in my little cubicle in tech services, um, and I did in-services with them, talking about our collection. Um, we started a new faculty senate library committee, which I was on, and that also had student representation. Um, so that we could understand also particularly where grad students are coming from, faculties on that to get some input, and then they could help spread the word. Um, we put information out in newsletters and had things prominently posted on our website. And the LibGuide, although you know, it can't be found a lot of times, um, I think by inserting the LibGuide that has some of these collection decisions throughout these different communication channels, um, people were finding it and I was getting a lot of good feedback from faculty. And then that feedback, especially when it had to do with cancellations, I could also take back to administration and say, look, they're saying this is critical to their research. Like, if you are wanting to support your faculty and be a research institution, this is what we need to move forward. Um, so I think we've had some really um, good success. Um, some We've forged a lot of good partnerships. And now, if if the bad times come and we have to make decisions, um, faculty aren't just like rolling their eyes and then like, you know, moving on. Uh, they're, they're asking questions, they're moving back. It's more of a partnership now, which is great. So our, our first year where I was like, no, we're not giving you that data. Um, we did have to make some modest cuts, but there were enough cuts that we could make that we were able to add more content than we actually cut. So it, it worked out okay. Um, the second year, giving administration the uh, like absolute data on what our inflation rate was gonna be for the next year and then backing up our requests with faculty feedback, data from ILL, um, re new research programs, we were able to get um, a little over an 8% increase overall. So, yay, um, everyone was happy. And new resources abound. Um, the third year um, was a rough year for the campus and um, rough all the way around and we had only about a 4% increase, um, which is less than what we asked for. Um, and so there were a few other modest cuts, um, but there was a big difference. It was a, it was, it felt really more like a partnership with faculty and administration wasn't dictating us what we did with our funds or having us justify ourselves. We gave them the data. We talked to faculty, made the decisions together about where we were going to move forward. Um, and then did what we needed to do. So that's all. Yeah. And um, hopefully you have some questions for us. We're really um, interested in what strategies have worked for you um, because there isn't one like perfect answer anywhere. So thank you. Hi, Sarah Kennedy from Cornell University. I was hoping you could uh, talk a little bit more about how either your institutions or the institutions you surveyed are communicating resource cancellations. And so both at the individual journal level, but perhaps also including things like large databases, package deals, and big deals. Um, this is something that we've sort of struggled with at our institution, um, uh, including the timing of when information is delivered because of course some things have to remain confidential during the negotiation period um, and then have to be, you sort of have to have a rollout of information. So could you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, do you want to talk overall first? Uh, or? For, for, for me looking at it, I mean, I, it's, it's um, as soon as possible is, is the thing because people, people, what I've experienced is that I'm always, working on it, working on it, working on it, and then, oh yeah, I gotta tell people, and it's like the last minute, and you really, the longer that they can know about it ahead of time, the better they can prepare. Uh, 
So we start, um, our fiscal year is, starts July 1. Um, so we start looking at things in January, February, um, and requesting where we think we're gonna be. We usually know by March or April, kind of ballpark, whether it's gonna swing in our favor or not. Um, so we can start getting information out before everybody flees for the summer. Um, but usually hard deadlines aren't until what, like October? So even then, there's usually time um, in the fall semester to get information back um, from faculty. Any other questions? And we'd love to hear what's worked for you well, too. Hi, um, you mentioned, this is for Anna, you mentioned that you started a committee through the Faculty Senate. In under 30 seconds, I think you said it. And I'm wondering how you got that process to work for you guys. Um, so there, there had not been an official library Faculty Senate committee previously. There was sort of an ad hoc group like years before that was um, informal giving information back and forth. Um, and when I came in and my uh, university librarian came in at the same time, it was one of our priorities. Like we need, we need this. Like we need to have a seat at the table and have the faculty senate understand where the library is coming from. And we also need to hear what they need. So we, um, sat down with the provost and talked about it first. Um, and then they agreed. And so then we worked with the faculty senate to get it formally added on. Um, and so now it's been going for, this is the third year. Um, and it's been really, it's been really helpful to have an effective and reliable communication channel um, with both faculty, but with also those student representatives. Um, we're working towards also a renovation project, and it's been really helpful to get the student perspective and they can share back that information. So if you don't have um, anything formal on your campus, um, it's really worth putting the effort in to get it going. Thank you, everyone.